Good afternoon and welcome to today's energy seminar. Uh, it's my great pleasure to in introduce Andrew Ponek, the co-founder and CEO of Antura Energy uh, here today. You may remember when we last met uh, a long time ago last week, uh, we had uh, four excellent presentations by student researchers who had won the awards for the best technical presentations. And I think we said at the end of that that sometimes people like that that are not much older than you go out and start new companies and win research prizes and change the world. Well, Andrew's kind of at least halfway, maybe more than, even though he's still pretty young, halfway down that road. He was a student here, took some time off, uh, did a very successful startup. Fortunately for Stanford, he came back after that, and then he went out after he graduated and did another startup called Antora Energy. I hope you find the story about that and the individual technology. Interesting, I worked with the GSEP project for 10 years and we thought we had seen everything. And this particular technology we had not seen and it looks very exciting and very promising. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Andrew to tell you how, do you, how he did it and how you might be able to do it too. Thanks. All right, well, thanks so much for the introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone, as uh, uh, you know, you're, you're sitting there. I, I used to uh, attend this seminar all the time when I was an undergrad, so uh, I was class of, of 2017. I did take a little bit of time off, but uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy uh, you know, this talk and, and all the rest uh, this quarter and beyond. It's a, it's a really wonderful uh, speaker series. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I'm Andrew uh, with Antor Energy, and um, you know, I'm just gonna go through uh, a little bit about what Antora does, the, kind of the larger context of, of the area uh, of energy that, that we're focused on, and then uh, a little bit about our, our specific solution. Um, so the, the first is uh, really to talk about the challenges in decarbonizing industry. And uh, you know, this is about one third of all global emissions come from industry, from, from making stuff. And so it's uh, certainly a, a sector that can't be ignored. Um, and then we'll talk about what Antor is doing uh, about that. So I think the, the first thing to talk about is why is decarbonizing industry hard? Uh, just like everything else, you know, it has its own challenges. But I, I would say that one of the biggest challenges in decarbonizing industry is that uh, about uh, two thirds and maybe as much as three quarters of the energy used in industry is in the form of heat uh, rather than in the form of electricity. And at this point, you're probably all uh, pretty familiar with the fact that we have good alternatives to fossil fuels to generate electricity. Still some problems that, that, that we can talk about, uh, particularly around variability. Uh, but electricity in some ways is an easier area to, to decarbonize than heat. Um, and so even if we've decarbonized the grid, you know, a, a huge chunk of those industrial emissions won't have been solved yet. Uh, and the, the real reason that decarbonizing industrial heat is so uh, problematic is that heat is really cheap. Heat from fossil fuels in particular is, is very inexpensive. And so it's, it's not so much a technical challenge. It's not that we don't know how we could generate you know, high temperatures or steam or anything like that with uh, electricity, for instance, that, that might be decarbonized, but it's just a, a problem of techno-economics. And uh, I'll just make one kind of larger uh, uh, point here before moving on. Techno-economics is everything in energy. Uh, you know, most of the, the, the things that are being sold in the energy industry are commodities. Uh, and so it really, really matters what, what your costs are. And so, uh, you know, if, if somebody has a demonstration that shows, hey, you know, I can take, you know, air and water and turn it into gasoline or something like that, which would be a, a wonderful thing, the demonstration alone is not actually that valuable. Uh, you really need to be able to show all the way through the techno-economics, not only that it is possible to do what you're saying, but that it is possible to do it uh, at a low cost. So uh, heat, again, is very, very cheap, and that's why it is so challenging to show how to decarbonize it. So, one of the ways to look at this uh, is, to, uh, is to focus on the cost of heat in a, a unit that probably many of us are more familiar with, which is uh, you know, US cents per kilowatt hour. So one of the things I've, I've noticed across the energy industry is people often don't like putting different sources of energy on the same axis. Uh, you know, there's, you know, for gas, for natural gas, dollars per MBTU, lots of people talk about dollars per kilogram hydrogen, electricity is all in cents per kilowatt hour or, or dollars per megawatt hour. Um, uh, oil is, you know, dollars per barrel. So all of these different things, uh, you know, all these different units make it very hard sometimes to figure out where are the challenges. And again, where are the challenges in the techno-economics of these areas, not just in the, the technology. And so uh, 
with the caveat that, that the, these slides were actually made before the recent spike in energy prices, which, which we can talk about, um, you know, natural gas in the U.S. has typically, for the last 10 years or so, been about one cent per kilowatt hour. Uh, natural gas in Europe has usually been a little bit more expensive, but not that much more expensive, between one and two cents. So, uh, you know, you, you may or may not have a, a sense in your mind of, of what that means, but you, you may have heard that, that some of the best solar and wind resources are getting down into the two or three cents per kilowatt hour range. They're variable, but they are that cheap. But this shows that natural gas is even cheaper. So even if you had a perfect way to turn electricity into heat, and you had the best solar resource in the world, it still is hard compared to natural gas, say, in the U.S. Uh, right now or, or in the recent uh, past. So one thing that, that uh, you know, a lot of people talk about is hydrogen. Uh, and uh, you know, what, what, what can you do with hydrogen? Hydrogen is, is a great thing, can be used in a, in a lot of different ways. But I think putting hydrogen on an energy basis on the same sort of cost axis is, is, is a bit sobering. Because if you look at uh, you know, gray hydrogen, so hydrogen made from steam methane reformation of, of, of natural gas, um, you know, the, so fossil fuel-based hydrogen right now is about a buck fifty a kilogram. You know, a lot of people are out there saying, hey, can we make green hydrogen that is the same price or even cheaper than, than fossil hydrogen and then, and then use that? And certainly there are places where that, that might be useful. But you can see here, even if you were able to beat uh, fossil hydrogen, you put it on the same axis as natural gas in the U.S. over the past... 10 years, you're, you're still missing the mark by a lot. And so this is why just showing that you could decarbonize a certain industry by burning hydrogen instead of methane to, to generate your heat doesn't necessarily mean it's going to, to take off and, and provide the sort of decarbonization we need. So uh, one thing that, that many people would look at this and say, OK, OK, but you know, there's no carbon price on the natural gas. And so obviously, there are some, the, some extra ounces, which is very important. And you know, if we do add about a, a $100 per ton uh, carbon price, that matters a lot. It, it really increases the, the, the effective price of natural gas, maybe to the point where some of these other uh, you know, things like hydrogen would work. But you can still see it's a, still a very, very challenging problem to meet the cost that people are used to within industry uh, for this heat. By the way, coal is typically even a little bit cheaper than this. Uh, and even though we've, we're mostly moving away from coal for industrial heat in the US and Europe, lots of other places are still using coal. Uh, so this, this same kind of argument uh, applies there as well. So one of the things that, that we've looked at at Antora is, well, you know, we talked about maybe a really good solar power plant or, or, or wind plant might be able to produce two or three cents per kilowatt hour levelized cost of energy, so the, kind of the average price. But, but one thing that's interesting is because of the variability, you often get big swings in price. Some of the time, the electricity price on the grid will be much more than that and sometimes much less. Um, and so if you actually look... Even in the U.S. right now, SPP is the Southwest Power Pool. So this is, you know, the utilities that are, or, or the, the grids that are sort of in the uh, wind belt. So, you know, think uh, Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas. Um, if you look at the, the 25th percentile uh, of electricity prices there, you know, right now on the grid, you're actually seeing something that's pretty competitive with, with natural gas. So you can immediately say at least 25% of the time, electricity is cheaper than, than natural gas and so could be a good replacement for heat. If you somehow were able to look just at the, the you know, 10% of the time that, that the energy is the cheapest, it's definitely cheaper than natural gas. So immediately you start to look at this and say, if we want to decarbonize industry, if we want to be able to compete with natural gas on price, a good starting point may be to take the cheapest electricity you know, when there's an excess, say from overgeneration of wind or solar, and then try to convert that into, into the heat that industry needs. Uh, of course, some way to, to store that, uh, you know, we'll probably add some, some adder on. These are kind of our own numbers for what that looks like. But we think that even uh, the conversion process and potentially some storage for that electricity uh, in the form of heat can, uh, can still beat natural gas. So a few things, you know, just to, uh, to talk about. These are some of my uh, pet peeves, so I'm sorry I, I have to, to, to share them all, is, is just that, that people don't go, always go through these unit conversions. These are approximate, for sure. Uh, they're, they're not exact, but they're close enough to, to, to get by. So one thing that I, I feel like you know, is, is really easy to keep in your head, there's kind of two factors of three between dollars per kilogram hydrogen, cents per kilowatt hour, and dollars per MMBTU, which is what everybody in the gas industry uses. So a dollar per kilogram hydrogen is about three cent per kilowatt hour electricity is equivalent to $9 per MMBTU natural gas. So just having that in, in, your, in your head, when you hear someone talk about like, hey, I'm going to make hydrogen at $2 per kilogram, you can go, OK, that's $0.06 cents a kilowatt hour. 
Maybe that's good, maybe that's bad, depending on the, uh, the circumstance, but at, at least you'll be able to, to compare it. Um, another one that uh, is pretty useful is, uh, you know, a lot of people are talking about putting carbon prices on uh, natural gas. Uh, there's even a larger kind of conversion or, or a more favorable conversion factor if you're looking at, at coal because it has higher carbon intensity. But for natural gas, it's about a factor of 20. So if you take, you know, let's say someone says, well, we're going to slap $100 per ton tax on, on carbon dioxide. Uh, you can say, well, that would be a, about uh, $5 per MMBTU uh, adder onto natural gas, which, again, you can see is, is pretty large because natural gas is usually about that price or in many cases cheaper. So we're talking about $100 per ton tax on natural gas, doubling the effective price of that gas. Uh, and, then, and then one last one uh, is, is that one watt for one year is about a dollar. Um, so that's whether you're, you're generating it, obviously, or, or, or consuming it. That corresponds to an electricity price of about 11 cents a kilowatt hour, which is usually within a factor of two. Very few uh, people are, are paying less than half that for their electricity or, or paying more than double that. So again, just some really simple uh, rules of thumb. They're, they're not exact, uh, but that allow you to start getting a gut feel uh, for some of these things. Again, in, in techno-economics, which, which I'm, I'm claiming here is really like what you should always be thinking about with, with, uh, when looking at energy technologies. Okay. So, uh, you know, the, the opportunity that, that sort of I mentioned before in the Southwest Power Pool and looking at the kind of variability of these renewables and, and the sometimes very low prices, you know, it all comes from what we know is a, is a huge uh, change in the energy ecosystem, which is really cheap solar and wind. And, and, you know, a few different places have estimated different numbers, but, you know, there's probably tens of terawatts of renewable, you know, solar and wind generation capacity that's going to come online in the next few decades. And then obviously our, uh, the big challenge that we're all uh, working on or, or that you know, many of us are, are working on and very interested in is how to tackle the approximately 50 gigatons of, of CO2 uh, or equivalent that we're um, emitting each year. So, you know, somehow, you know, combining those two, you know, using one to solve the other is, is what we should be aiming for. And the problem is, uh, is variability. Like that, if, if it weren't for the variability of solar and wind, this would actually be a relatively easy problem. We could decarbonize a lot of different sectors of our economy uh, quite rapidly. So uh, if you look at uh, the, the typical ways people are storing energy, like lithium-ion ba batteries, we, we do get a problem of them being too expensive for certain use cases. So uh, this is a, a German uh, renewable generation plot over a couple weeks, I think last November. Um, and you can see that there's about 50 or 100 hour gaps sometimes where there just isn't that much uh, wind blowing, you know, because a lot of this is pretty wind heavy uh, grid. So, you know, typical lithium ion battery installations right now discharge for about four hours. You know, that's, that's where they're very competitive and we're quite bullish actually on, on lithium ion batteries and what they're going to do in the future. But you can see that there's still kind of an order of magnitude gap uh, between what lithium ion can do economically right now and, and, and what is needed. And one thing I'll, I'll mention right here, uh, I said what lithium ion can do economically. There, there's, there's nothing that prevents you from discharging a lithium ion battery slowly. You, you can take a four hour lithium ion battery, four hours just being the ratio of power to energy. Um, you know, you can just discharge that slowly and cover that whole gap. But if you do that and, and your lithium ion battery is only ever discharging very slowly, it means it's gonna go through fewer cycles of charge and discharge over the course of a year and it won't make as much money and it won't pay back the high capital cost of those batteries. So the, the, again, the problem with long duration storage, if you hear people talking about, oh, there's a problem of long duration energy storage, it is entirely a problem of techno-economics. We have plenty of technologies that could cover that gap. They just can't do it in an economically competitive way. So this is a big problem. You know, we think lithium ion is gonna solve a lot of the problems. It's gonna solve a lot of these short duration problems, but a few days uh, is sort of out of reach for what lithium ion can do comfortably. Um, and the, the, the way we've looked at this problem and, and uh, the, the different approach we've taken is to look at storing energy in the form of heat rather than in electrochemistry. So storing energy as heat has a couple of advantages. One is that you can uh, use very, very inexpensive raw materials. Lots of different things can, can get hot. We have our favorite material, but there's lots of options out there. Uh, and then the other thing is you have the potential for very high energy densities. And energy densities uh, are incredibly important because uh, you know, while sometimes techno-economics just focuses on the unit itself, it's very easy to forget all the stuff that goes around it. You know, the shipping, the land, the, you know, uh, all of the uh, pumps and steel that have to go around whatever your, your battery is or whatever the energy storage itself is. 
So it's really easy to forget sometimes if you have a low energy density solution, you're going to pay penalties in other areas. And so again, so thermal has the potential, not always realized, to see energy density similar to that or even better than that of lithium ion batteries while being able to be made from very, very cheap raw materials. So let's go into uh, what that looks like uh, in Antora's uh, view. So in, in our system, we take uh, energy, uh, electricity, that could come from the grid or, or directly from uh, solar or, or wind or, or any other source. And we actually put it into uh, a, a thermal battery. So we're actually resistively heating material to very high temperatures. Uh, at those very high temperatures, uh, our, our material is actually glowing. It's glowing hot. And so what comes out of the, the side of, uh, of this unit is actually a, a, a beam of high intensity light. It's this very bright glow coming off this very hot object. And so once you've converted uh, the, the energy, the electricity into this kind of stored energy and heat and then to this very bright light, you can do one of two things with it. One is you could directly uh, you know, address industrial heat. So you could turn that uh, into steam by you know, putting that light on a steam pipe. Uh, you could put it on something higher temperature like uh, calcination of, of minerals like uh, are used in cement. Um, the other thing you could do with it is uh, actually turn it back into electricity using a photovoltaic cell. So photovoltaic cells are already very good at turning light into electricity. So this gives us something that, that's pretty interesting, which is that not only uh, are you very flexible in, in what kind of input you're taking, you're also flexible in the output that you're providing, whether that's industrial heat or uh, electricity. So looking a little bit closer at, at what this system looks like, um, you know, we have this, this core gray box uh, which is about 100 megawatt hours of, of storage, uh, and that's stored in the form of solid carbon. Um, and then what you have are these kind of discharge modules, these you know, shiny boxes uh, on the side, which are the power modules. So they kind of bolt onto the side of this unit, and they accept the light that is coming off of this uh, and turn it in either into a useful form of heat or into electricity. What's between those two is essentially a shutter. So when you don't want energy coming out of the system, you close a shutter that's right at the, the interface there, no energy is coming out. When you do want the energy, you open it up and then you're discharging. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of different ways that you could approach this. So when, when we were starting out, we, we had this sort of luxury, you know, we didn't have any existing technology or any kind of preconceived notions about what this, this had to be. So uh, we were able to start pretty technology agnostic and, and look at all the different uh, aspects of the system. So the first is you have to choose what material you're going to use to store heat. Um, we, we chose carbon out of a, a number of ones that we uh, investigated. Uh, the second thing you need to do in a thermal energy storage system is think about what is your heat transfer mechanism. Actually, most uh, thermal energy storage systems use some sort of convective heat transfer. You actually you know, pump a fluid of some sort through your, heat, uh, through your thermal storage and then bring it somewhere else where you, where you need the heat. We chose something a little bit unusual, which is to use thermal radiation, you know, the, the glow coming off of a hot object. And then finally, you have to choose, if you want some of that energy to come back in the form of electricity, which we do in, in many cases, uh, you can choose uh, what heat engine you want. And there are many options, many different heat engines out there, and we chose photovoltaics, uh, you know, which, which has a few advantages. And, and you know, each of these three materials or heat transfer power conversion methods, they all have drawbacks. But one of the things that was really interesting is we found that the, the combination of these three worked really, really well together. They solved some of each other's problems. Um, so I'm going to go through a little bit about how that works and why this is a, a good pairing. So the first one is why carbon? Uh, few, few things. One, it's very, very inexpensive. Uh, and one of the reasons it's very inexpensive is it's used in steel and aluminum. So huge quantities of, of solid carbon, often in the form of graphite, are used as electrodes in, in aluminum and steel. And so there are huge supply chains that make very, very large quantities of these. Uh, another thing that's really nice about carbon is that you have access to very high temperatures. Uh, and you have a high specific heat. And so if you look at this plot, that sort of combines both the specific heat and the temperature range. So you can see the, the, the kind of energy stored is the area underneath these curves. And so graphite or, or, or carbon you know, has the ability to go to these high temperatures and it has a high specific heat. So you end up storing a lot more energy uh, than you would in something like steel or in kind of ceramics, you know, metal oxides. Um, and then finally, it has a high thermal conductivity, which is always very important in a, a thermal energy storage system because that's just helpful in getting the heat out. Um, 
you know, this is just, uh, you know, compared to a lot of other different companies that are uh, looking at, at thermal energy storage, you can see the energy density, again, because of the carbon having that huge area under the curve there, it is quite high. Um, and another way to look at it, which is, you know, going away from, from the numbers and everything, is, is just a picture like this. These are uh, electrodes that are used in uh, the aluminum smelting industry. So you can see they're made in, in absolutely enormous quantities. They're very, very, very cheap. Uh, and what you're seeing here is about a gigawatt hour of, of energy storage uh, potential in, in that carbon. So uh, th th these are some of the reasons why we really like carbon. So the next thing is, is why radiation? So, so what, what heat transfer mechanism do we want? So uh, using light uh, in the form of thermal radiation to move the heat uh, is, is a very simple way to do it. It has a lot less moving parts, things that can fail compared to, say, pumping a fluid around uh, through it. So uh, what's important here is that uh, thermal radiation, as many of you probably know, uh, is uh, very temperature dependent. So it's actually to the, uh, to the, proportional to the fourth power of temperature. So if you have twice the absolute temperature, you're getting 16 times as much uh, power transferred through radiation. So this is a very powerful effect, which means if you're at cold temperatures, you don't get much thermal radiation. Uh, and so this would be a really poor heat transfer mechanism. So this kind of explains a little bit why people haven't looked so much at radiation as heat transfer in thermal energy storage before, because most thermal energy storage has been at relatively low temperatures, uh, often because the, the input source of that heat is something like concentrating solar or combustion or something else that's temperature limited. And so if you were, if you were limited by your heat input to low temperatures, you had bad thermal radiation, this was a bad idea. Once you move to charging with electricity, once you say, hey, look, we, we have this opportunity with cheap solar, cheap wind to have tons and tons of cheap renewable electricity, now you can charge up to whatever temperature you want. And again, this is where carbon sort of solves one of the problems of this. Carbon can go up to very high temperatures, which allows uh, radiation to be such a, a good heat transfer mechanism. So again, it's, it's kind of enabled by this different uh, you know, uh, temperature range that we're working with. Um, and then a, a few other things th that's interesting. So you might notice that the, the geometry is here, uh, here is, is kind of unusual, um, which is that your uh, thermal storage is kind of in the shape of this U. Your power module, which is where you're extracting the power, is on the top there. And then you have this big void. And, and that void is actually really important. If you, if you didn't have the void and you just filled the whole system up with carbon, uh, then you'd have to conduct that heat all the way through a, a lot of carbon before it gets to the power module and that would limit the rate at which you can extract power. And this is actually one of the reasons why people usually don't use solids as thermal energy storage uh, in, unless you have convection as well, because it's just con conduction through a solid is not good enough. But here again, by, by using the fact that we're at high temperature and light, thermal radiation carries that heat so effectively, adding this cavity means we can discharge heat from very deep within the system. And, and so kind of a, a fun factor here is if you, if you set yourself to say, I want to be able to pull this heat out within 100 hours. You know, I want to be able to fully discharge all that, all that heat that was in that carbon. If you look at it without any uh, cavity there, you would get a certain amount of energy that you can extract. By adding the cavity, you actually get more energy that is extractable during that period of time. So that, that, that it's kind of counterintuitive to say like, hey, here's the amount of usable energy stored in the system. What if I remove a whole bunch of the thing that's storing energy? You know, that should reduce the amount of energy that, that's stored. But in this case, you're increasing the amount of energy that at least you have access to uh, because you're drawing it from sort of deeper within the system. Uh, again, another kind of advantage of light here, as I mentioned, is, is that you can have a very simple mechanism to control the discharge, which is to put a shutter between the power module and the thermal storage. Um, and then uh, finally, it, it gives you a lot of flexibility. Because it's in the form of light, you can make either electricity uh, or heat out of it. I'm actually going to skip that one. So let's talk about uh, how to turn uh, heat into electricity with a photovoltaic cell. So we said this is hot. It's glowing. Light's coming off of it. We put a PV cell in front of it. It turns it into electricity. Th that's an easy thing to say. Uh, but if you take a traditional solar cell and put it in front of this glowing hot object, you're actually going to get really terrible efficiency, probably less, certainly less than 10%, probably less than 5% efficiency. That's not good enough for uh, thermal energy storage like this to be competitive. Um, so there's one thing, though, that, that, you, that you can do a little differently. So it, here, here's our kind of black body spectrum. You can see that uh, you have your uh, carbon and, and your semiconductor. You know, if you're, if you're talking about high energy photons, photons above the band gap of the semiconductor, 
then the photon will immediately create an electron. That's you know, how PV works, and uh, that's what you wanted. So that's all fine and good. The problem is that at these temperatures, most of your photons uh, are in the, the infrared, and they're below the band gap of the semiconductor. So all of those photons would otherwise be lost in a traditional PV setup. Uh, in this case, we put a very, very good reflector behind the semiconductor and reflect those infrared photons right back to the carbon where that energy is reabsorbed and, and recycled rather than being lost. So let's talk about why this is possible in this system and not in solar. The, the reason is because it's, uh, it's a closed system. If you reflect photons back to the sun, uh, nobody gives you credit. You don't get to say your efficiency was any higher. Uh, it, you weren't really recycling them. You were just kind of putting them somewhere else, losing them in a different way. Uh, in this case, though, because it's a closed system, all of these photons that you're sending right back to the carbon, that energy stays in the system, and so that increases your efficiency overall. So that's the key uh, to, to you know, how Antoria is getting uh, higher efficiencies. Um, and just to, to provide a little bit of a, a sense here, uh, over the past few years, thanks to the work of, of many, many folks on our team, uh, we've been able to uh, take TPV uh, from uh, under 30%. Actually, the best uh, TPV that had ever been demonstrated before we started working on it was in 1980 here at Stanford by Dick Swanson before he had left to start uh, SunPower. Um, so it's a, it's a sort of Stanford invention through and through. Um, but so previous best was, was just under 30%, uh, and then we've been able to get to over 40%. And that's really just about making better mirrors behind the cells to reflect that light, and then using some of the higher quality PV materials that we have access to now uh, that Dick Swanson didn't have 40 years ago. Last thing I'll mention here is about size. So, uh, you know, you may be familiar with solar panels are kind of big and bulky. I, I showed this very small unit and I said it was a megawatt. Uh, it, it's really because of this. Uh, when you're very close to a hot object, uh, you, you get a lot more light from that hot object. And it's really because if, if, you, if you imagine yourself as, as the PV cell, uh, your, your entire sky is bright. Your entire sky is this hot carbon. Whereas you know, here on Earth, the sun is a, just a very small dot uh, in, in the sky. So even though this is cooler than the sun, it's much closer than the sun is. So you get a few hundred times as much power out of these cells than you would a traditional solar cell. Okay, so we've uh, gone through uh, kind of the, the carbon, the, the heat transfer in the form of radiation, uh, and the PV as a way to convert some of that power uh, back uh, into electricity. And so this is just kind of recapping, uh, you know, not only are they kind of nice ways to store thermal energy because they, they solve some of each other's problems, uh, we also have the ability to draw on existing supply chains. So again, the, the, the materials used, like carbon, very, very inexpensive. Uh, the thermal hardware, if you want to, you know, say, take uh, the, that light coming out of the system and turn it into steam, also pretty easy to do. There's plenty of uh, steam tubes from the oil and gas industry that are meant to, to uh, operate based on radiative heat transfer, um, OTSGs. Uh, so, and then the, the last uh, is the photovoltaic power conversion, where we can leverage a lot of work that's been done uh, to improve photovoltaics over the years. Okay, so... Uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about where, where Antor is at. We're currently working with a, a small uh, prototype. It's about the size of an elevator here, uh, 500 kilowatt hours uh, that we've been operating for uh, over 1,000 hours. Uh, we're able to leverage a lot of experience in the high temperature furnace industry, uh, as well as PV manufacturing to prepare ourselves to go up quite a bit in size. Uh, our next system is a 100 megawatt hour pilot that we're working on uh, near Fresno. And, and that's funded in part by the California Energy Commission uh, that we're very grateful for their, their support. So uh, lo just looking at this system again, uh, you know, a few hundred kilowatt hours thermal, um, and you know, we were able to build this system very, very quickly and, and relatively cheaply, uh, exactly because of all the, the other st stuff we mentioned in this presentation, which is you know, it's very cheap raw materials and it's pretty kind of standard industrial engineering. This was actually an off-the-shelf furnace that we modified to become a thermal energy storage unit. Uh, this is uh, a little bit about that, that next site, um, which is again funded by the CEC, which should be about one of those uh, uh, blocks that we, we've shown in those uh, renders. Um, by the way, that's about the, the same size that we imagined the commercial product would be. So if you want more than a megawatt, you would just tile those one megawatt blocks together. All right, so a little bit about just the economics, because again, I was saying techno-economics is, is everything, and 
you should not take my word for any of this. And, and you know, if you were an investor, you, would, you should say, hey, I want to go look at all your spreadsheets and see where all this comes from. But for now, uh, you will have to take my word for it. Uh, this has the ability to, to be very inexpensive. And, and uh, if you look at sort of what an industrial customer typically pays for electricity and heat today, uh, you're, you're talking uh, somewhere around here. If you were to sell, there, there are different ways you can sort of structure uh, the, the, the money here. But here I'm just saying, let's imagine you're selling your heat for the same price as heat today. You're now able to deliver them electricity at a much, much uh, lower rate. So again, that's because you have one one box that is taking solar or wind electricity in and then providing power and heat to the industrial customer every hour of the year. Uh, and, and this is what uh, we're saying is we could beat the natural gas grid and the electric grid, uh, which is the other way they could uh, get that energy with our system plus on-site renewables. Okay, um, this is just uh, talking about the market, which is very large, but uh, I think the more, more important thing is that we can address it uh, due to the, the very inexpensive system that, that we have. Uh, but this is the, the, the real fun, uh, which is the amazing team. Uh, there is uh, someone from the audience who is in this photo, so you can uh, try to figure out who that is. <laughs> and uh, this, is a, this was our, our ribbon cutting this summer. It's a really, really wonderful team. Um, you know, for any of you that are, uh, you know, looking at internships in the future, we absolutely love interns. Uh, we have taken many interns, including from the Tomcat uh, internship program, so I'd, I'd highly recommend that. If you're interested at all, uh, or if you know someone that you think would be interested, we are hiring uh, quite a bit right now. And so please uh, send an email to, to hiring at antora.energy uh, to, to get in touch with us. Um, so that is uh, everything I have. I would love to hear what questions you have. All right. Um, what's the biggest roadblock you guys are currently facing? Is it scaling, manufacturing? Just curious. Yeah, I think one of the biggest roadblocks is, uh, is actually in project finance. So uh, when, you know, after this first unit, which, uh, you know, itself is a relatively large unit, we have to figure out how to, to, to pay for that one. Kind of the next step is what we think is going to be one of the hardest things, because you're in this weird in-between zone. You're, you're, you're talking about amounts of money that are larger than a company like ours can just, uh, you know, put out itself. You know, we can't just build it on our own dime. We have to get someone else to pay for it. But it's also still going to be a relatively untested technology at that point. So if you go to a bank and say, hey, I want a loan to be able to build this next unit, they may say, whoa, 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 I've never heard of Antori, I've never seen this unit, like how do I know it's going to last 20 or 30 years? And so we, we think that's going to be one of the biggest challenges. How do we show as soon as possible uh, that this is a very, very simple, very reliable system so that immediately after that first one, we can go to customers and we can actually get a bank or someone else to finance that system rather than having to pay for it uh, ourselves or, or force the customer to pay for all of that themselves. So it's really a matter of how do you kind of put the risk in the right place. Uh, yeah, we, we, so uh, the, the question was about uh, kind of financing. We, we have raised uh, some venture and uh, we will be raising more and, and we have also raised a, a fair amount of grants. Really, really happy uh, with the, the supporters we have there. Uh, we have uh, ARPA-E, you know, the California Energy Commission, uh, other funding from the, the DOE, uh, the NSF. Uh, we've raised about 17 or $18 million in uh, grant funding so far. Awesome. Uh, thanks so much for an interesting presentation, Andrew. Um, I was curious, what are some of the key trade-offs that your team is thinking about when designing the system? Um, thinking about metrics like energy density, round trip efficiency, self-discharge. Um, yeah, how, how do you manage all of those different trade-offs? Great question, great question. The, the trade-offs are, are where all the, the interesting stuff lies, right? So um, I'll, I'll mention a few of them. Uh, one is uh, on the, the system itself and the design. So I mentioned that, that cavity, which is really allowing the heat to get out. There's a lot of interesting optimization to, to do around. How big should that cavity be? Obviously, the, the endpoints don't make any sense. If you make the whole thing cavity, there's no carbon, there's no energy being stored. And as I said, if you make no cavity, uh, then you can't get the heat out very effectively. Uh, but the, the size and shape of that cavity uh, are something that we, we have to figure out and that we're, we're working on. It also, uh, the optimum cavity varies depending on how fast you want the heat out. So if you want the heat out really fast, you probably want a bigger cavity so, so the extraction happen faster. If you are okay with it coming out really slowly, you'll have a smaller cavity because you just want more of the, the energy stored. So not only is, is there that, we, we want to kind of find a happy medium so that we don't have to change every installation is going to have a different 
geometry. Maybe that's possible at some point in the future, but we want to find something that we think is going to cover the bases well enough uh, to sort of meet everyone's needs. So, so that's certainly one that, that we're thinking about. Another one that I think we've mostly settled on now, but there was an interesting optimization, was the size of the system. So uh, you know, any thermal energy storage has the trade-off uh, around uh, heat leakage. So you want uh, the system to leak as little heat through the insulation as possible. That, that's just self-discharge. That's loss. Um, and so one way to do that is to put a lot of insulation around it, which we definitely do. The other way to do that is to make it really big. And then your surface area to volume ratio uh, is, is better and better the bigger you go. And so you'll, you'll leak less heat uh, percentage-wise that way. Uh, but on the flip side, if you make these really big systems, you run into other problems. Like, you know, can you ship it? Uh, is it bigger than a certain customer would need? So we kind of want to make the smallest system that we can to make it kind of shippable and meet the market needs, so be able to be kind of modular, while still being big enough that uh, it doesn't leak too much heat. And so one of the things we've, we've done with the system is, is try to make it modular in, in different ways so that it can be shipped in parts and then with, have very limited assembly on site. So that allowed us to get kind of bigger than any one piece that could get shipped while still not having to move into a mode where every bolt and, and whatnot is being done on site because on site construction is way, way, way more expensive and failure prone than, than assembly in the factory. Yeah, great question. Uh, th thanks, Andrew. This is, uh, this is really great. Um, given your emphasis on uh, techno-economics, can you talk a little bit about the breakdown in unit costs from the carbon storage uh, to the thermal radiation uh, tra uh, transmission and the photovoltaic uh, modules? Um, kind of how do the unit economics break down? And could you have done this a decade ago when, you know, before photovoltaic module cell prices had sort of precipitously declined? Yeah, great question. Um, the, you, you could say very roughly the breakdown of the system is about a third, a third, a third between the, the power components, like the, the, the PV uh, itself, the, the energy components, which is the carbon blocks and the insulation, and then about a third is maybe the kind of everything else category, you know, all of the site work, the structures, uh, kind of the balance of plant. Um, you know, the, the, uh, as far as could we have done this before, um, Yes and no. Uh, actually, the, the PV technology that we use is not silicon PV. The, uh, we're using 3.5 semiconductors, uh, which are the type of semiconductors typically used in, in uh, like space applications, for instance. Now, these are much more expensive, like at least 100 times more expensive than regular silicon PV. Um, however, as, as I mentioned earlier, you're getting so much more power per area uh, that it's okay that it's 100 times more expensive. You're getting 100 times more power up. So the cost per watt ends up being uh, pretty similar. So uh, the, 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 the question, though, like could we have done this before? Actually, the cost of those three five semiconductors has also come down uh, over time. Obviously, the, the whole thing has been shifted up versus silicon PV, which has been coming down, but from a, a much lower starting point than these very high efficiency cells. Um, but uh, so that, that, that's why it's sort of a, a yes and no. Yes, but not for the reason you think. It's, it's not because of silicon PV dropping in price that, that makes it so uh, available to us. Yeah, I'm sorry if I missed this earlier, but who, who would you say is your primary customer base? And the uh, second part of that question is, assuming you get the project financing that you would need, uh, what is, how long would it take for you to scale it to commercial application? Yeah, great questions. Um, so the, the customer base uh, is, w that we're focused on is industrial customers. So uh, you know, there, there's absolutely applicability of this for the grid. And we actually have a number of partners that we've been talking to uh, or, or working with that just want this for the, the straight electricity storage. You take electricity in from the grid, you know, output it later when the sun's not shining or wind's not blowing. So, so there is something there. But we found the industrial customers to be a, a really interesting uh, area uh, for a few reasons. One is that uh, they, they value some uh, of the resiliency benefits of having the energy on site. Even if the grid goes down, they can, they can keep going. As you might imagine, after some of the PSPS here and the, the Texas freeze, you know, people are very interested in those benefits. But the other side of it is uh, the, their energy prices are typically higher. So kind of like, you know, solar PV on rooftops uh, can kind of displace very expensive electricity at the end point. You get something kind of similar with industrial customers. Industrial customers are very large, so they get pricing that's a lot better than you would at, at a home. But they're still not paying quite the same price as the sort of wholesale price on the grid that a utility would be buying and selling at. And so that helps as well. And then the third factor really is the fact that they can use the heat. 
Um, and so it, that, that's where the economics of the system become really, really good, and there's kind of a, a big differentiation between Antora and, and what other solutions can provide. So a few examples of, of where you might do this. Uh, you might do this at a mine uh, that is both, you know, needs electricity to, like, crush the rock and maybe needs some heat in order to, you know, drive some process that extracts a mineral. You might do it at something like an ethanol plant that, uh, you know, uses both a lot of heat, uh, you know, for uh, distillation and, and then also electricity for everything else at, at the plant. Um, you know, paper, pulp, uh, chemicals, there's a lot of different areas. Again, you know, about a third of emissions come from this sector in, in general. A lot of that is heat from all of these, these different uh, areas. I guess one, one last one I'll mention is, is uh, food and, and ag. Um, you know, that, that's a really big area where they use a lot of heat um, in addition to, to electricity. Um, the, the second part of your question is about uh, you know, project finance and, and scalability. Um, so you know, th there's kind of uh, if we have if we had all the money <laughs> that we wanted, we actually think we could uh, you know scale up very rapidly. Uh, we think that that probably project finance is going to be the, the limiting uh, factor for us uh, because uh, you sometimes you just need to see uh, years go by before people get comfortable with a system like this. Um, sort of after project finance, everything else is, is much more solvable problems. You know, there, there are existing supply chains for the different components of this. Of course, there'll be some aspect of us just having to get used to, to building this, overseeing the building of this. You know, the, the development of these projects, sometimes you'd be limited even just by finding a customer who has a need like this, working with them, working with the plant manager to make sure they understand how this is going to integrate into all of their systems. So th there are certainly steps other than that, but that one really is the main one. Uh, you said, do I have an estimate for how long? Right, like how long of a lead time from, say, project financing to actually solving that issue? Ah, yes, yes. So from, from the time that we have project finance in place, we think we can install a full project in less than a year. And that's, again, largely because of the modularity of the system, which allows most of it to be built in the factory and then just kind of minimally assembled on site. Andrew, this is an interesting question. Can you put up your slide where you show carbon and steel and concrete and other storage media for a second? Yeah. Oh, that's it. Okay. Now, these materials you're not doing a phase transition in. Uh huh. And, you know, traditional thermal you know, or, or, or solar thermal energy generation, part of the way they do the load shift in the storage is they use a a material with a big phase transition, and so they store. Now, they don't go to the same temperature you do, uh -huh. but the energy density is good. And if you thought about some kind of hybrid where you use a phase transition material, maybe you don't take it out as radiative energy, but you take it out at a lower temperature through some more conventional mechanism. So I'm curious, phase transition materials, where would they fit in this plot? Yeah, phase transition is super interesting. Um, so... Uh, the, the main reason we haven't done phase transition, and, and we've certainly looked at it with a few different uh, materials, is just the complexity of having liquids in the system and then the actual freeze-thaw cycles. It's very difficult to get a system that you're going to be sure is going to last for, for decades when it's gone, undergoing you know, contraction and expansion, you know, freezing and thawing, uh, but then also just the containment. Uh, once you have a, a liquid and you have to contain it in some sort of tank, you have to be really careful about, you know, is it going to leak? There's you know, pressure at the bottom of, of the container. So just to explain why we haven't done it, that, that's the reason. Uh, why, why we would like to do it is what you just said. You can get very high energy densities. Uh, you, you, one of the best materials actually is silicon, which has a phase transition at 1414. There's actually a company called 1414, uh, which is, uh, was, was founded around the idea of using the silicon phase transition as a way to store thermal energy at high temperatures, very energy dense. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, there, there are people looking at this, absolutely. Uh, we've seen kind of the practical challenge with, with that, not worth it. One thing I, I will mention, actually, if you look at this, uh, I do have 1414 up there. Uh, so, you know, the, you, you, you can get very high compared to everybody else kind of in, in energy density. You know, the, we're able to, to match or even exceed that, you know, largely just because we do have that enormous range of sensible uh, heat uh, temperatures to, to go through. But if you look at, like, how much energy we store between... 1500 and 1600 C versus what a silicon phase transition would do at 1414. Like you're getting way more energy out of that phase transition. We only make up for it by going to extremely high temperatures on the hot end. So they, they might beat you on volume. Uh, it would be pretty close on volume. Yeah. 
Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I was just wondering, are there some unavoidable losses that would maybe cause like a an existing limit on how high you could go with the efficiency, even with advances in technology or materials? Yeah, yeah. So uh, a, a lot of limitations. Um, unavoidable losses, certainly, you know, uh, just heat conduction through the insulation, uh, just leakage is an unavoidable loss. You know, typically, we, you know, we keep that very low, again, by, by making a reasonably sized system and putting a lot of insulation. But that's actually one of the things that, that uh, sets our upper end temperature. You know, insulation gets uh, more expensive and uh, its performance is worse as you go to higher and higher temperatures. And so both of those things are, are hurting you. Uh, and, and because of that, you know, at some point above 2,000 degrees Celsius, we sort of have had to, to draw a line and say, it's just not worth it anymore to pay for the amount of insulation we'd have to put to, to keep those losses under control. Um, so that's absolutely a, a sort of limiter. Um, you know, one other uh, kind of limiting factor uh, on the PV side is, you know, PV is a heat engine, just like uh, lots of other heat engines. It, it has Carnot limitations, and then there's practical limitations far below that. So we think that, you know, even with kind of a, you know, perfect uh, TPV cell, you're probably not going to ever see more than 70% uh, efficiency, heat to electricity, which would be very, very good, and we'd, we'd love to have that. Uh, but, but to give a sense, like, that's kind of a practical limit, even though it's not the theoretical limit. And then we're looking at sort of more near term, hitting about 50% uh, efficiency uh, w with those cells. And so that's, uh, you know, that's a limit that, uh, that does matter. Uh, you know, round trip efficiency does matter, but w what's interesting is in some of these applications, like very long duration storage, uh, the, the cost matters a lot more than the efficiency because you're not necessarily using this system that many times over the course of a year. Um, you're using it for continuous amounts of time, you know, uh, long periods per time, but not that many times. And because it's a very long duration system, you can be sort of choosy with when you're charging it. You can charge it only sort of at the peaks of, of, of the day when there's a lot of solar that would otherwise be spilled or at really low price times with wind. So that, that, all of those things kind of push efficiency to be a little less important than it would be, say, for a lithium ion battery and makes cost even more important because you're basically trying to make a big bucket uh, of energy compared to a lithium ion battery. So those are a few limitations that we're always thinking about. Any final questions? Uh, actually, I had one, one comment. Uh, even since you've left, uh, one of the big new things on campus, I think the newest initiative uh, is the Sustainable Finance Initiative. So I think on this financeability question, uh, there might be some synergies there. So there's a few people we could talk to. One, I've actually studied technology diffusion a lot, not at the depth that, uh, it, that you would need, but uh, it is often the case that it's, can we get people to want to buy this and you beg them to buy it and then it becomes a good, the big new idea and then you can't keep up with the <laughs> demand for it. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping uh, for all of us that that is exactly what's going to happen and I'm pretty confident that uh, you can pull it off, partly because you're looking at this in such a flexible way with many often uh, on-ramps, which I think is a key thing in innovation in general. So with that, I'd like to thank Andrew for, uh, for an absolutely inspiring uh, talk full of uh, numbers. Uh, and you explained a lot of really complicated things in a pretty easy uh, to understand way, even for all of us who are, aren't that well versed, and the audience for asking some great questions that allowed Andrew to uh, expand upon those. So thanks again. And we'll be looking forward to you. Thank you.